Everybody else has other things they pray, you know, of course it's all welcome. Uh, but this is just something we can all come together. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read it or pray it. Uh, Psalm uh, chapter 20, it's like if we're addressing Pastor Carl and Sister Norma, uh, but of course we're praying to the Lord. Um, Psalms 20, uh, read the whole chapter starting in verse 1. It says, In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. And may He send you help from His sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May He remember all of your gifts, all that you've done, and look favorably on your burnt offerings. May He grant your heart's desire and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Now I know that the Lord rescues His anointed King. He will answer Him from His holy heaven and rescue Him by His great power. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Those nations will fall down and collapse, but we will rise up and stand firm. Give victory to our King, O Lord. Answer our cry for help. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a great prayer uh, for different uh, circumstances, but it's what we're believing together as a congregation uh, for uh, the leaders that gave so much, you know, for, for so much time. Um, so praise God for that. Um, so let me go ahead and get into the Word. I don't know if there's anything else. I know, um, the, I know there's questions people have had about, you know, uh, the nature of our ministry and where it's going. I don't have answers to all that, but I do want to say since we are recording and broadcasting and things like that, if people do have questions that are uh, listening, to you know, comment, send us emails, whatever. Um, if there are friends on Facebook, they can look at my profile and find my phone number. They can call me. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so uh, so but yeah, but for now we're just gonna keep on ministry. You know, God needs us by week. Um, but okay, so I, so I want to get into the word. Make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Um, so 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 let me just kind of uh, explain how it's gonna go down. Cause it's gonna be kind of kind of uh, different because um, it's Mother's Day, right? And I, and I even have I have written. It's not my title, but I have written Mother's Day service because today's Mother's Day and you know, we're having a service. Um, <laughs> but it's not a Mother's Day message. Although I am going to talk about mothers, um, so what I'm doing is I'm hijacking the holiday <laughs> and using it to illustrate the spiritual principle. <laughs> so the title is actually A Mother's Heart and then slash The Spirit of Discipleship. Hmm. Right. Mother's Heart, The Spirit of Discipleship. And just so you know, when I say spirit, I don't mean like a spirit, like. Ooh. <laughs> I just mean like the heart of discipleship, the, the attitude of discipleship. Like what does discipleship mean? Like what you know, what's the attitude that one who's discipling should have? What does that even mean? And um, and so the reason why I say it is the reason why I describe it that way is because it's a it's a revelation that God gave me years, years, years ago. Um, and I don't remember exactly when it was, I just remember I was in a bookstore that my wife was working at. And she was working there at the time. She wasn't your wife. <laughs> uh, she might have been. Yeah, I think she was. Yeah, she was. Because we were talking about a poem that I wrote, a Mother's Day poem. I'm going to read it. Um, but God gave me this revelation about discipleship. Okay, so, man, I feel like there's so many things I need to kind of explain before I say what I want to say. But let me, explain, let me say this before I say what I want to say. Sometimes I say things that are controversial or that are like that can be misinterpreted and you know what too bad you know I'm imperfect I, I was thinking earlier just in my head not, not like seriously but I was just in my head thinking if we did have a church like we just start our own church and, and title of our ministry would be the imperfect church and that, would be, that would be a title of a church that I would pastor is the imperfect church because I, I have a lot of flaws and, and, and so I, I say things that can be easily taken out of context and that can be you know I've, I've actually been called by pastors who want to talk to me about you know things I've said, um, but but sometimes to make a point, you know, I'll say something, and and um, and you can take that you know to extremes, right? Especially to, in today's you know atmosphere, especially politically, things are taken 
you know, to extremes just to prove somebody wrong, just to, and so you could easily do that to me. Probably any, any almost any sermon I preach, you could probably do that. But anyway, so I'm gonna do that today. Um, so, so years ago, God gave me this revelation. This revelation was that a mother's heart is the heart that we're supposed to have in discipleship. This was like I said, years, years, years ago. I've never shared it. I've never preached it. I've never, you know, said it to anybody else. You know, it's just something that I've known myself because, you know, it sounds kind of weird, especially when you break down what you're going to do, how I've understood that. Um, but I believe that um, discipleship is uh, very, very important. It's something from God's heart, but I believe that a mother's uh, love is a good illustration of how, I mean, a good illustration of how, how discipleship works. Don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming to understand a mother's love or to be an authority on a mother's love. You know, I hardly, actually just the other day there was a disagreement. Uh, not a disagreement, but a discussion between um, uh, two parents, me and Lydia. <laughs> it wasn't an argument, it was just like, hey, you know, we were talking about... <laughs> Let me be more vague. <laughs> so there was a parental discussion about children, and the discussion went something like, hey, you know, our child, you know, is in a situation that they might fail, they might, you know, end up failing if they don't you know, um, do what they need to do, they're going to mess up, they're going to have a, a bad experience. And that was the mother's response, the father's response was, um, let them fail. <laughs> let them fail, let them learn from their mistake. They're going to fail, they're going to learn from their mistake, and they're never going to do it again. And I was like, you know, I'm, you know, not that these words were spoken literally, but the heart of the mother was, I'm, I'm not going to let my child fail. I'm going to protect my child from failure. I'm going to make sure my child you know, accomplishes what they need to accomplish, that they complete what they need to complete. And the father was like, they're not going to learn that way. <laughs> the way they're going to learn is that they fall, they hurt themselves, they get that bump, that bruise, and then they'll become better. And the mother was like, no, no, I'm going to protect my child from falling, from bumping, from, you know. And, and it, was a, a, it wasn't a right and wrong discussion, it was just different hearts. Different hearts, and that's why God puts, you know, not, not that a single parent doesn't work, but the ideal situation is, you know, for a person to have a mother and father. God puts them together to be able to um, to raise a child well, right? And so, so and so there's like a different heart that a father has than a mother has, right? So I'm not claiming to be an authority on the mother's heart because that, even then I was like, no, you know, that's wrong. what you're saying in my mind is like what you're saying is wrong to me, right? But it wasn't, right? It wasn't wrong. You know, it was just different, right? And so, so I want to kind of, from my perspective, understand or. Not understand, but bring understanding of what I mean by a mother's heart, right? So I'll go to, uh, so I'll just tell the whole story, right? I, I was at a bookstore, and they were my wife used to work, and um, they used to sometimes um, use stuff that I wrote. I used to write things, I used to write stories and poems and stuff, and they would have it, like something like that. Like I had a little booklet with poems, and they would they would actually sell them there for me. Like they would buy them from me, and they would sell them also plaques and little poems, right? And so I wrote this poem. It's a Mother's Day poem. So it's fitting for the day, and I had no idea how this could um, um, point towards discipleship. And even like if you read it, it doesn't make sense. But the reason why it, it the Lord showed me that is because there was a mother who was reading it, right? And I was talking to her, right? We're, we're reading it, and then the mother said, "This poem brings me a lot of conviction." Right, as a mother, and I, and, I, and I was confused when she said, she didn't explain either, um, but God, God showed us. So let me read a poem, right? It's called The Watery Shield. Everybody in my family has heard it at least. Um, and, and so, but I'll, I'll read it um, again to, as a refresher. But okay, so the poem is called The Watery Shield. Shield. It's a little long, uh, but the perspective of this, of course, I wrote it, right? I wrote it about my mom. Who's here? And, and so, um, this the the perspective is just is this proud, confident man, uh, you know, talking about his life. Or it's a, it's a young man talking about his life and how great his life is. He's a believer. You know, he's got faith in God. And he believes that that he somehow deserves God's favor and that God loves him. And it kind of it starts off with the person feeling entitled. To God's favor, right? That's kind of the, just to kind of lay out the, the, um, 
the setting, right? How it is. So that that man is speaking. So the water is shield. Each day I step out with confidence and pride, throwing caution to the wind with no reason to hide. I give thanks to my Lord, because I knew that he was near. He's my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's given me the land, and I'll take it by force. Was there need to worry? No, no need, of course. Then, one night as I slept, I slipped into a dream, and an angel showed me what I had not seen. Each day, at each corner, there awaits me a snare, carefully placed, and I unaware. And dangers around me that I couldn't see, as if there was an enemy's plot against me. On and around me was this watery shield, and no trap or evil could break the force field. This must be the favor of God in my life, for I walk and I face evil, yet I suffer no strife. Then the earth seemed to tremble, and the angel spoke out. His voice was as loud as a thundering shout. There is someone who stands in the gap day and night and prays for your safety with all of her might. That which surrounds you is a shield like no other, for God has made it from the tears of your mother. I stood in humility, for I then understood what I lacked in my life was more gratitude. So, I, so, Mother, I ask that you will forgive. You are the reason that today I still live. You gave me my life on the day of my birth, and through prayer preserved each day on this earth. Though it took a scolding from an angel above, I thank you for my life, and I thank you for your love. Right? So that's the poem, right? The Watery Shield. I wrote it for my mom, and I mean every word of it. Um, you know, she has preserved my life, and I should be dead uh, if it weren't for her prayers. Um, but it was kind of threw me off when I, when I, when this mother read this and said she felt conviction. I was like, why conviction? I mean, I, I, as a son, I would feel conviction, but her as a mother, she said she felt. And she didn't explain. She just like said, yeah, it always convicts me as a mom. And then, and then, so I kind of walked away just confused. But then the Lord answered. You know, answered me and you know, you know, some and showed me how, you know, her prayers, you know, she, you know, how, the the responsibility that a mother has to be praying for her children and to be and sometimes you know it's, it's I don't I don't agree with it. But sometimes there is guilt involved, right, in moms and in them, you know, looking at the their their children's lives and how they're going about it and, and their role in it, right? And so, so God started to show me. The, the mother's heart. It started to show me her prayers and her efforts and the things that she does and why she does them. And I didn't understand that at the time. Um, and then, so like I said, I'm hijacking Mother's Day and he started to show me how discipleship was like this. And I started to feel conviction about discipling people. About, you know, my care for the others' walks, for their life, for the, for the, for the results of their life. Hopefully through the message that will make sense. Um, but I am going to say a few things that might be controversial, like I said. Um, but let me get into that. I just want to lay out where that came from, right? And so now, you know, t uh, I, I feel the Lord leading me to take this opportunity to share that, right? But definitely not, not taking anything away from a mother's heart. And hopefully we'll get more appreciation for it. Um, but also see how God would have us apply that to discipleship. And how He wants to bless His church through this. Amen? Amen. 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 So... Um, so that's why it's called the mother's heart, the spirit of discipleship, right? And so, so the, the reason why I say it's controversial and, and a perfect example, there's a movie um, that some like, some don't like. Uh, I think it's called The Shack, right? And it's a movie um, based on a book. And, um, and there's, there's a lot of ministers who don't like that book, a movie or a book. Uh, they say it's controversial because, and I, I do like it. Um, again, I'm imperfect. I'm not, you know, saying that it's, it's endorsed by God or anything like that. Um, but what I like about it is what others don't like about it. What, they don't, what people don't like about it is that there are scenes, there are parts of the movie is where God is a woman, right? God, he, he's played by a woman. And actually that's how God in the movie is first introduced as a woman. And so, so through a big chunk of it, 
it's a woman, right? Pregnant, and, and then, and then, but it's God, right? And so that's where people are, like, you know, got you know Hollywood and uh, whatever, all the controversy and all this stuff. Um, but later on, God comes out as a man, you know, as a you know, first he's a black woman and then he's a Native American man, and it's like different. So, so, but it explains it in the movie that that you know whatever you, you know. I, you're seeing me like this because this is what you need to do, right? And so, so that's the part that I like, right? Um, is that that God is, is whatever we, we need Him to be, right? Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I can already see where that can be, you know, taken to extreme. And it's going to get even worse because I'm going to explain. So, so, like, I would ask, like, I would ask the question: Is God a man or a woman? Right? Like, I would ask that. Like, like, you don't have to answer me right now, but in your head, like, is God a man or a woman? And, you know, most would answer that he's a man. And, I, and I've had, this, I, I've had, what I'm going to show you right now, I've had this argument with people before, with believers, and they still don't believe me, and I've shown them in the Bible, and they'll be like, what Bible is this? <laughs> like, exactly, exactly this happened. Exactly, and I remember, it was, I was, I used to work in a grocery store. I didn't work for the grocery store, but I worked in it, and I had a little booth just like this, and I used to sell things, and then there was uh, somebody who was talking to me about marital problems, and I was saying, you know, hey, you know, remember that like, women are, are also made in God's image, and what? No, they're not men made in God's image. And we're like going back and forth, and I showed them in the Word, and they're like, what? What Bible is this? I didn't say that. And it was just a regular Bible. I still have that Bible. It's all beat up. It's old, but but anyway. So here's here's the controversial part. So is God a man or a woman? Well, God God is a man. God is a father, right? God, God, God is a Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I've heard teachings. Um, I wouldn't say that I would teach the same thing necessarily, but I kind of understand that. I've heard teachings where they say that the Holy Spirit is like the feminine side of God, or has a more of a feminine type qualities. And uh, feminine is not a bad word, right? <laughs> feminine is not an insult, right? Let me, let me say that, right? If I were to say uh, that God were feminine, that's, that's not an insult, right? Um, so, so let me, yeah, right, yeah. Everybody turned up there. I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah now it's just us. Now it's just, now it's just the real group. All right, so, I remember we're having this discussion with me, me and this person, and, and, um, no, you know, the, it's a man, the woman needs to submit to the man, because the man is the authority, and the man is, you know, we're the one who made in God's image, and we're the one who, you know, who, who reflect who God is, and so they need to respect that. <coughs> And it's like, well, you know, let's see what let's see what Genesis says, you know, about that. And so, so I took them to Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-six, and I said, okay, so let's see, let's see, is 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 is, is man made in God's image and woman isn't? Is that what, what we're discussing here? So, Genesis one twenty-six says, then God said, let us make human beings. In our image, right? I'm reading out of the New Living, so some might say man, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, let me, let me, let me, just for the sake of, of uh, clarity, let me, let me get a different translation, just so nobody uh, makes an issue of that. But, sorry, so, so bear with me as I do that. But I'm going to go to Genesis, chapter 1, very beginning, and I'm going to, one, and I'm going to use the, the New King James, it's a pretty... Uh, standard and verse 26 6 getting there scrolling scrolling okay so then God said let us make man in our image right so this is where somebody can say well it's talking about men it's not talking about women right because it's man right and the new living it says let us make human beings right but all right so let us make man in our image According to our likeness. So who's our? Right? So our is God. So God is there speaking. And if you read through the Bible, you learn that Jesus is present. And you learn that the Holy Spirit is, is working. So it's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? So God says, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image. According to our likeness. Let them... Man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right? Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So, so this is where, like, I remember as we were reading, you know, me and this person, um, and he was like, yeah, you know, man, you know, man in his image, God, man, man, you know. And so God made man in his image, the woman, man and woman, God created them, right? So it's saying man and women are made in God's image, yeah. right? So, so, and the way it makes sense to me, you know, don't, don't, this is like, this is one of those things where it becomes controversial because I'm trying to make a point, but somebody could stretch it and take it to a, somewhere else, but I would rather speak the truth as God shows me, as imperfect as that is, not that God's imperfect, but I'm imperfect, um, and, and not be afraid to say the truth and, and instead hold it back and be afraid that somebody's going to misunderstand me. So hopefully nobody will misunderstand me, but I believe, personally, that the way this makes sense in my head is that when God made Adam, that Adam had all the qualities of God. You know, God breathed into Adam, breathed into his nostrils of him. So he had, he didn't just look like however God looks, but he had God, of God in him. Right? And so he had all the qualities of God. Right? And so whatever God has, Adam had a version of that. Right? And then, and then so that was Adam, right? And so the Bible describes how Adam's by himself, right? There's all kinds of animals and all kinds of whatever, but Adam is by himself. And then God gets Adam and he pulls out of Adam the woman. He, he, he makes Adam out of the dust. And then he breathes of God into him, right? So he's made of dust. This is dust. But what's inside is of God. And then he pulls out of man. He doesn't pull out of the dirt or pull out of somewhere else. He pulls out of the man and he makes a woman. And I believe that the qualities that make a woman a woman, the nurturing, the caring, the loving, the I'm going to protect my child at all costs, I believe that those qualities came from the man and they were separated and put into a woman. And at that point, there was this separation because obviously men and women are different. But it wasn't that God found a different source to bring these qualities. He, he was, the source was the man. Right? And I believe that, I believe, this is just me, I have no way of biblically proving it, but I believe that man lost some qualities from himself and they were put into his, his, his wife and then, but they became one, and so he still had them, but they were outside of him. And I believe that I still have those qualities, but they're in my wife. And so whenever me and my wife are at our best, we, though we might be different, then we are in God's image. That's what I believe, right? And that's what I believe the Word of God teaches us, right? So you kind of get it where I mean with the controversy and all that stuff. I don't mean it to sound like spooky or, you know, like weird. I just mean that a woman should feel like when she's at her best, she is reflecting who God is. That she shouldn't have to try to be a man in order to be in the image of God. Right? That, that, so God has, I believe, God, everything that you think is valuable and is godly in a woman. And the Bible does go into detail of that. I'm not going to do it today, but we can, you know, everybody refers to Proverbs 31. No, but there's, there's qualities throughout the Word of God. Um, that reflect how a woman is different than a man. I believe God has all those qualities. I believe God has the nurturing, the caring, the loving, the protecting at all costs, mm -hmm. as well as the authority, the let them learn from their mistakes. You know, the the we're going to train them, we're going to teach them, we're going to strengthen them. You know, He has both. He has He's the perfect balance of both, and so. Um, so we can't say that woman is not made in God's image. We have to say that woman, because the Bible says it, is made in God's image. So then what image is God in? God has those qualities. So that's why I say it's not an insult to say that God is fat. You know, to say that God um, has feminine qualities. You know, you snap that out, you know, that's, <laughs> post that all over the internet, that's going to sound horrible. I don't mean it that way. I don't mean that God is lacking any masculine qualities. I just mean that he's the perfection of both. Right, does that make sense? Uh -huh. Anyway, so yeah, so now that I've lost...
resurrected. He was going to be the Father. So when he told them, Behold, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth, they knew what that meant. That, 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 to them, it was just like a continuation of what was already going on. They're like, okay, Jesus isn't leaving us. Like he's leaving us, but he's still with us, just like he's always been with us. Because they understood that type of discipleship. They understood that walking and talking and, you know, be living each other's lives, part, being a part of each other's lives, and, and doing it in a way where they were growing spiritually. Right? They understood that. And so when he said this, um, I believe that they saw that as Jesus continuing to disciple them, but also as an example that they needed to follow. Right? And, I, and I'll illustrate that. Um, well, let me, let me first... Um, let me read that. Yeah, let me, let me read that in the Amplified. I just read it in the New, in the, uh, in the New Living Translation. And the, the, I, I like to go through different translations, not because um, one is better than the other, or because it will say one thing and it will say something different in another one. It just kind of makes things clearer when you read several. But they say the same thing, right? But so, like in Matthew. 28, 19, in the, in, the, uh, in the Amplified, it says, go there, it says, um, in 18, Jesus came up and said, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me. Believe in me and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And then it says, And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances and on every occasion. Sounds like a mom. Even to the end of the age. Right? And that's when I read that, that's when I was like, yeah, that sounds like a mom. You know, because it says, remaining with you perpetually, and it's whether you like it or not, <laughs> I am with you. Right? Regardless of your circumstances, I am with you. And on every occasion, I am with you. Even to the end of the age, I am with you. Right? And so that's where I, you know, I picture that mom, you know. Chasing their kids, so as they're going out to college. Yeah, drum bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's the heart of the mom. And, and so, you know, so that kind of like made me pick a bit of, but also it shows me that it wasn't just words that Jesus was throwing out. He was saying, you know what, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you think, no matter what you feel, I am with you. And I know that every mother, every good mother, wants their kids to know that. That they're never alone. That they're always with them. Whether they like it or not. <laughs> Um, but I also believe that Jesus was asking us to follow that. Like this is in the Amplified, I think it paints a better picture of what Jesus was saying. But if we go to the Book of John, uh, thirteen, John is this way. You're wrong way. John, thirteen. Verse 12, I believe this is where Jesus is uh, not just telling them how he is, not just describing himself, but being an illustration, right? And I believe that he is that for us. I believe that Jesus is a life illustration for us to follow, not just for us to understand or know or think, oh yeah, this is what our Savior was like. But I think that it's an example that we are to, to, to we call it to implement, to, um, to um, we call it reflect that. There's a word. Emulating? Yeah, probably emulating. That sounds about right. Um, but uh, so John 13, verse 12, right? It says, so after washing their feet, right? So Jesus just washed his disciples' feet, right? He put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. Verse 14. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their masters, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, 
God would bless you for doing it. Right? And so this is where Jesus you know, explains, it's not just what you're seeing me do or learn of me, but do the things that I do. Right? And so when Jesus is telling his disciples, go and make disciples. Go and, and, and you know, teach them, show them the things that you've learned from me. And then when he says, I, have been with, I will be with you always, I believe that they understand that they need to, not that, that you're going to be with whoever you're discipling all the time, but you're going to be there for them. You're going to be there in spirit, right? Because like, I know, you know that I have people with me, even when I'm all alone. Right? Even when there's nobody with me, I know that there are people with me. There are people supporting me. I have you know, great, wonderful uncles who are far, far away that are with me. Right now, they're with me. They're supporting me. They're praying for me. They, and then and they send me words of encouragement. Right? And other ministers, and even people that maybe don't even think about me now, but they've, they've you know, invested into my life, and they're with me. Right? And I believe that the disciples understood that. That we're supposed to have that kind of impact on each other. Right? We're supposed to help each other grow. But I believe that the Word of God um, puts in the context of uh, parenting, in a sense. Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, and, I, and I'm like approaching, nearing the end of the message. Get, we're getting there. Um, but, but so I just wanted to make sure that we understand that you know, God is the perfect parent, right? And that Jesus asked us to be disciples as, as, uh, as using himself as an example, right? Make disciples and be disciples, you know, and he was an example. And then I want to show how discipleship is like parenting, right? So that, that's, well, this is like the last part of the message. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. And again, so we're, we're, we are in transition, right? We're, we're from, you know, we're at, at a church that is closed. We're not going back there. And so different people are on different levels as far as uh, some have already found a church. Some have not even started looking. Some are, you know, have been at home. Um, some already have ideas. Um, but we're in the process of looking for a church. And so that's why I teach these things, or why I feel the Lord leading me to, to share these things. Because we need to understand that we need to be looking for the first message, if you guys remember, eight messages ago was about pastors. Right? And the next one was about iron sharpens iron, how we need each other, how a congregation needs, how we need a congregation. We don't just need to listen to a pastor on TV, right, or on the internet. And and then and then so now I'm talking about discipleship. We need to be looking for discipleship. We need to be going into it. And I remember that I learned this, um, I was trained, I lived with a pastor for two years. Lived with him in his house, with his family. He had a lot of kids. <laughs> and I lived with them for two years, and that's how I learned about discipleship. And I remember when I when, when that church left, and I went to my next church, which was the Word of God, which I went back to it, I remember going up to pastor, Pastor Pete at the time, and I was like, um, can you disciple me? <laughs> you know, like I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to be discipled. Yeah, that's how I understood Christian growth, you know, to come, is through discipleship, through being, you know, invested into Right? And so, so yeah, it's, it's something that, that means a lot to me. But in Ephesians chapter 4, so as we're looking for churches, we need to be looking for opportunities to get disciples. And if we've been in, 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 the, in the faith a while, we need to also be looking for opportunities to disciple. Mm -hmm. To pour what we have and we've learned into others. Um, Ephesians 4, uh, I'll start in 11. Um, it says, now, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and our knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So just notice, I'm going to keep on going, but pause there uh, and on 13. That he says, we will be mature in the Lord. Right? They're, they're using words of growth. Right? Of, 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 you know, to me, that's why I relate it to parenting. Because you're trying to get from a level of, of um, like being new, right? being a, a baby, 
and then you're going to grow into a mature person. Um, so I believe that that you know these words are used for a reason, right? So so that's why 13 again. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith, such knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature, like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, verse 15, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of His body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts to grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Right, so this is the picture that the Bible gives us, that we are to be, like, as children growing up, that's how we should be in our faith. We should be looking for growth opportunities, for, for you know, not staying in the same place that we are now, right, or the same place that we've been. You know, there's, there's always a, a need for growth, and then, and you know, not at the, well, I guess for the sake of time, I won't get into it, but there is a whole lot, um, as mature believers, where it's, in the Bible, I can think of several scriptures, men and women, where the Bible specifically talks about pouring what we, our, our knowledge and our experience into the younger people, mm -hmm. and equipping them, right, and so, my point is that just because you're already mature in the, in the things of God, you've been serving God for 30 years, 40 years. Man, I'm, I'm, part, I'm part of that. I've been serving God for 30 years. Um, just because you have that doesn't mean that you're done growing, that the process is done. There's still that part of you pouring into others, right? So, mm -hmm. so this goes to all of us. Um, and so, yeah, so the Bible paints that picture. And actually, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this and then just have one, a couple, or one more story. Um, Proverbs 22. Right? So, so in Ephesians 4, it talked about how we are, we, in our faith, we are as children. Right? And that we need to mature. Proverbs 22, and, and people are, are, a lot of people are very familiar with this scripture, uh, with parenting, but I want to give the context of of discipleship. So Proverbs 22, verse 6, and this is very important for parenting as well. To catch, this is a real short verse. But Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, in the New Living Translation, it says, Direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. Right? And so I've heard people. I don't completely believe this explanation, but I've heard people explain, well, it talks about when they're children, you should guide them and teach them and, you know, um, what does it say here? Um, direct, direct them onto the right path. And, then, and when they're older, they will not depart from it, right? And, then, and people say, well, what about the middle part? You know, it talks about children, it talks about when they're older, and it's, oh, well, those are the teenage years. <laughs> you just never know what's going to happen. I, I, don't, I don't believe that every teenager needs to go through uh, rebellion. I do believe they need to test boundaries and develop, you know, come from a place of just following beliefs that are put upon you and internalizing or even developing your own new beliefs. I believe in that process. But I just don't believe in that explaining away rebellion. Right? I, I that, that, that's right. But I, I, I get the point that when you do the the, the teaching and the investing and the guiding and directing in the path and then they have to go through their experiences they have to test and find out that oh what mom said was true or what dad said was true and then wait, wait a minute that was true or, you know and, and then sometimes they're gonna find that something might not be true right like they're gonna test all that and internalize um, what I can say to children about parents I feel like I've said this before I'm not sure if I have um, is that a good parent or even a so-so parent is, go is only going to tell their children what's best for them or what they believe to be best for them. In other words, a child shouldn't feel like they're going to come to the parent and the parent might try to trick them or try to tell them something that they mean for bad intentions or for, you know, not for their best. 
right? Anytime a child comes, and I even tell my people that work, people that, that, that I have authority over, I tell them, look, if you come to me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what's best for you to succeed because that makes me succeed, right? So I might be wrong. Don't, you know, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, I'm not saying that everything I tell you is right, but anything I tell you is for the sake of your improvement, right? And same thing with, with parenting. You know, anytime, you're, anytime you go to your parent, they're going to tell you things that are going to help you to grow. Right? Um, they might be wrong. They might make mistakes. They might have things, you know, a little bit off or misunderstand the situation. But their intention is always going to be for your improvement, for your growth, for your, for your betterment. Right? So you should come boldly. Come boldly and ask. Um, and it's the same way with discipleship. It's the same thing where, you know, we should be seeking out people who, who are newer, who are inexperienced, and to develop them, to help them, to help them walk. And, and, and this, this, this isn't an age thing, right? And, you know, I've seen, you know, young people, you know, minister to older people, like elderly people, right? It's not an age thing. It's just a willingness to, to impart, you know, what we have, you know, what we have of God to impart into others, right? So it's not about, you know, okay, well, who's younger than me, you know, because... Sometimes they're younger or more mature than we are, and vice versa, right? So, but th that intent should be there for the, in the body that we're, we're going to be speaking things to help each other grow, right? To help de develop each other, right? And then, and then we go through our, our challenges, we go through our storms, and the, the, but if we do it, then in the end, you know, we're going to stay on the path, right? Or what did it say? It says, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Right, and and that to me that speaks to people that I've seen. You know, there's there's specific people that I think of whenever I think of you know like I I haven't been so consistent in my life with church. I've had where I'm involved and then I've got left for time and then come back. Um, not back and forth, back and forth, but just been gone and and then back. I've been back for over 20 years, 30 years, 25 years. I don't know, about a lot of years, <laughs> many 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 years. But um, but there's those those uh, you know struggles and but they come back right if they what's been imparted into them uh, or if something's been imparted into them right and like I said I think of I, there's people that I think of that I've left church gone for a couple of years and I come back and they're there again they see the same people again and then, you know you know whatever whatever happens in my life I go and they're there they're still there right and so that means that they were disciples right somebody poured into them. Things that help them be mature enough to stay, right? If we do not disciple, then we are not going to be having people stay. We're not going to have, be developing mature believers, right? We need to be out there discipling, and we need to be looking for discipleship. We need to be, you know, looking for people to guide us and lead us. We, we all have, you know, growing to do, right? Yeah. But God, and it's not, it's not us looking to man, and not looking to God, but it's just us looking into the Word and seeing how God has, you know, what God has established. And He uses men to talk to us, to lead us, to guide us, right? And of course He talks to us, like this message, I'm, I'm telling you, God spoke to me, you know, He showed me a person, and, and, and I learned from God, so God does speak to us, but, I mean, there are so many more lessons, and probably some that I don't even realize, that God has instilled in me through people, that have taken time with me, that have walked through struggles with me, not just preached at me. So, I mean, sometimes you can you can minister to a person without saying a single word. Amen. Just be there. Just hold their hand. Just cry with them. You know, or, or rejoice with them. And you're ministering to them. This is all part of discipleship. Um, I meant to say this earlier, but I'll share this, this short story. I'm not going to get into all the details, but you, you all know, or if you guys know, um, my story of, of my relationship with my father, with my earthly father, right, um, with dad. Um, and, and, and I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I am going to say this. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, and, and the reason why this came to mind is because just recently I was ministering to a, to a, to a young, uh, young person, um, and I was explaining how um, the way... In, in, the reason why I explained about how God is the perfect parent is because we need to have a good understanding of, of, of what a parent is. Um, 
uh, we just explained it. I'm trying to I'm trying to say it in short words and it's not coming out. So I'm going to have to say it out. But I, but I was explaining to this young person. I was telling them about my walk with God. I was like, you know, because they were they're young, right? And I was like, you know, I know you're young, and you know, you might feel like you know you're you're oh, because they made a comment about when they grow up, you know, maybe they'll be able to look back at their life and, and make sense of it. And I was like, probably not. But <laughs> but just because you're young doesn't mean that you can't understand your life and what God has for your life. I said there are things that do that do matter. Um, and I'll give you my example and explain how my relationship with my father, um, I believe that because I had an earthly father who was, you know, not only any disrespect, but he was greatly lacking in parental skills. I'll say it that way. <laughs> I had a father who lacked parental skills. And and um and that kind of affected my view of God, right? I strongly believe that, or I say I believe, right? I believe that the reason why I came to, to church when I was 16 and I gave my life to Jesus and just completely, you know, surrendered everything, and then, I don't know, a year later, I walked away from the church and went back into the world, didn't pray anymore, didn't, you know, but got into... Uh, sinful living um, and then came back to the church and was you know uh, even went into ministry and then uh, was living you know a church life and then left again and went back into drugs and back into you know um, getting arrested and having an unfruitful life and then came back again <laughs> so I went I, I had you know several this is years right that happened and this is like, like, I would say the first 10 years of when I first heard the gospel to when I finally, me pasi or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but, but one major thing, and I had to be, actually I didn't realize this until I was telling this person. But one thing that always was in me was just a view of a father. Like I just, I had a, an unhealthy view of a father. I, I couldn't uh, really understand what a good father was like I, I just didn't didn't have, have that internalized and so there was only so much so close that I could get to God and then you know I, I couldn't get closer until in my own life when I was uh, in my 20s I was like 25 maybe 24 25 when I came back to the Lord and I wanted everything you know I, I didn't want to go back and forth anymore and I remember what God did is that He started to work in my relationship with my father, who, you know, you guys know that I had, it had been very, very rough to where I had hatred towards my earthly father. And, and, and then God just miraculously started, you know, changing my heart and His heart. And little by little, and it took a couple of years of changes and things happening, but we got to a, a point of not even being able to you know, have a conversation to hugging every time we saw each other and saying, I love you constantly, I love you. That was just, you know, just a, a, a normal part of our conversation. I love you, and then him, I'm proud of you. And, you know, having that relationship that was unimaginable before. Once that happened, I never struggled with my faith. I never struggled with, I never even came close to feeling insecure or getting close to leaving the church or leaving my walk with God and not even it hasn't even been a, a consideration since then and it's been 20 years plus um, but I believe that that was a part of it is that my view of a parent of a father was you know injured was, was unhealthy yeah. and once God healed that for me, he happened to do it by healing my relationship. I'm not saying that that has to happen. I'm not saying that it's not that if, you, if somebody has an unhealthy relationship with their parent, that they can't serve God. But they need to stop putting the qualities of the earthly parent onto a God and a Father. Amen. And they need to see that God is a perfect parent. He's a loving, caring, nurturing, discipling, authority, you know, all those, he's, he, he's all, he's a perfect parent. And when, when that view of God as a perfect parent is healed, 
They were able to be secure, as any child is secure when his parents are loving each other, when they're together, when, when the home is safe, the child feels secure. Amen. When we have a view of God as a healthy parent, our faith becomes secure. And, and you know, that can be taken different ways, but I believe God has me sharing that for somebody. Right? And so, so yeah, it's, others might feel differently, and there's, others might have other stories of how they struggle with their faith, and some other totally different way, other than the parents, how they um, became secure. I might say this is the only way, but this is a way, right? Mm -hmm. And God is the perfect parent, right? Yes. And so, if we understand, and I don't to get so much into the heart of a mother, but I'm done with, I'm done with the message. But if we understand the heart of a mother and, and how she wants to protect her, not just her child, but their life and their growth. And we as believers need to see other believers the same way. As, as taking care of them as, not, not so much the person, but their faith. Mm -hmm. Seeing their faith and wanting to protect their faith and help them to grow in their faith. That's how we should be viewing each other. That's the discipleship that Jesus asked us to do. And if we do that, we will be a part of a strong, healthy church. <laughs> Amen. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. Let me go ahead and pull this up here. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I uh, thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you speak to us, not just to pour words into us, but because you love us. And because you want us to have lives that are fruitful, that are, that are beneficial to ourselves, to you, your Amen. kingdom, and to, to our community, to the people around us, Lord. Amen. I thank you for that, Father. Amen. I pray that your word did not just be um, in us, but that we speak to others of it, that it, that it live through us, Lord, Amen. and that we not only be blessed, but that we be blessings, Father, in all that we do, Father. Amen. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence here. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for loving us and Amen. guiding us and leading us as a mother leads their child. Holy Spirit, you lead us and you guide us and you nurture us through our lives. And I thank you for that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for loving your children. And I just speak a blessing, not from my mouth or from my words, but from you, Lord God, a blessing over your children, that they are loved, they are cared for, that they matter, that their lives are significant, are important, and are greatly needed Amen, yes. in, 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 on this earth and in your kingdom. I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. I thank you for, for, for pouring that love into our hearts and into our minds. Thank you for giving us mothers who, who reflect your love, who, who, who are your love on this earth, who help us to see what love looks like. Lord God, you've given us mothers and, and, and other people in our lives that have helped us to understand how you love us and how you care for us and how you would do anything for us. Anything. You would lay down your life for us. You would give everything away and have nothing for us. For the sake of our growth, for our benefit, that's the love that you have for us. Yes. And that's the love that you've allowed us to see in our mothers and in other people that have poured into our lives. And I praise you for that, Lord God. Help us to, to have a day of honoring our mothers today. And I pray a blessing over, over all moms, Lord, that, that I know that, 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 they're, that they have an imperfect love. But Lord, but they have access to a perfect God. And that through you, Lord, they can be a perfect mom to their child. Yes. As they walk um, in your ways, as you guide them and lead them. Lord, I bless every single mother. In Jesus' name we pray.